What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like some of the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You know, uh, I have Jennifer and Freddie. I'm in a, a remarkable story, and she's gonna and Freddie is gonna talk about a little about the businesses. But um, you know, I've had the founder of uh, Baby Einstein on, Jennifer uh, Julie Clark, and you know, she grew Baby Einstein to $20 million with five employees and sold to Disney. But the most impressive part to me is when she was talking about beating cancer twice. You know, it's the stuff that bridges business and actual our personal lives together. The other thing I was going to say is Ed O'Keefe. Ed O'Keefe is the founder of Wake Up Foods. And personally, um, you know, I love their stuff at Wake Up Foods. Healthy, delicious wake up waffles. Check out the episode with Ed about time collapsing. And you have to talk, uh, you know, you have to read about time collapsing because father of seven grew uh, and grew up in a household of 13 children. Okay. 13 children, Jennifer. Um, and he has done everything from sold over, you know, $50 million in marketing systems um, for dentists and started a supplement company with seven kids. So it's amazing. Now there's a reason which you'll see, you'll see in a second why I talk about Ed and seven kids entrepreneurship and Jennifer today, before I tell you about it, this episode is brought to you by rise 25. If you don't know about rise 25, I won't go into it too much. Check it out. That's what we do. John and my business partner and I, we actually started it. We actually help people launch and run their own podcasts and make sure it um, gives to their best relationships. I've seen no better way to give to your best relationships than having your colleagues, your friends, your people on and, f- you know, featuring their thought leadership. Um, I do consider it. If you check out inspiredinsider.com, my about page, it's inspired by my grandfather who uh, was a Holocaust survivor and his legacy lives on because someone did an interview with him. Um, and so the full interview is there. And so when I have people like Jennifer and Freddie on, I do consider it I'm leaving, uh, they're leaving, I'm helping them leave a legacy as well through this content. So um, thank you both for being here. And of course, I'm gonna you know, give a special shout out, thank you to Dean Dutro and Ryan O'Connor of Worthy Commerce because they introduced me to today's guest. You know, Dean emailed me, Jennifer, he's like, you need to have Jennifer on. She's amazing. Um, what she's done in her family life mixed with entrepreneurship is amazing. So. Thank you guys, Dean. You can check out their podcast and I'm sure you could watch the interview with Jennifer there too, Re- Relationship Commerce. Um, Jennifer Adams Bunker is a serial entrepreneur, founder of True Kid, True Baby, Physic, True Buddy, Velocity Source Group, and Phenopolis. And you know, when Jennifer is creating a business, she has one goal in mind, which is, you know, it's a funny thing. I was like, is it to make money? No, it's to make life easier. She's got six kids and like so many businesses make life easier. And mom of six, it's not always easy to balance an entrepreneur and a mom. It's not a, you know, honestly, Jennifer, it's not even easy to balance one or the other, like just in itself. Right. So she's grown true kid to well over seven figures. Her goal is for each of her six kids to own their own business. And you can go to truekid.com. It's T R U K I D.com where they have natural products for kids, skin creams that help soothe eczema, to sunscreen that's safe for eczema prone skin to, you know, Mark Cuban, I remember, you know, he always talks about in on the shark tank that his kid, one of his kids or something has it. So if, if someone knows him, like maybe they'd like these products, uh, true kid, um, body wash, much more. We have Freddie bunkers here who is the favorite kid right now <laughs> because he has a company called Hypergo and Hypergo is a full body wipe. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. Thanks both for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned Ed because my husband is one of 14 kids. 14, wow. Yeah, and um, you know, there are how many nieces and nephews? 50? There's like 51 first cousins, first cousins and it just gets bigger from and there. And 65 second cousins. So it's- uh, What's Thanksgiving like? What Like yeah. how big is Thanksgiving? Well, like when they do like the family reunions, it's like sometimes they'll do a big uh, like fairground. That's- <laughs> yeah, or a wedding. Weddings are big and they're fun. 
So when you, you know, I don't know, when you first got married, when you were discussing kids early on, Jennifer, how many kids were you thinking you were going to have? Oh, uh, Jeremy, I wasn't going to get married or have kids. Really? Uh, Why? Like, I, I just didn't think it. I just thought, you know, I was going to forge in the world my own. And I just didn't think I needed a guy to, like, support me. And I certainly didn't need kids because they cried and they were yelling, you know, <laughs> short pass. And then I meet this guy, which, first of all, I thought it was lying. Who has 13 sisters and brothers? Like, that's. And I would I would ask questions every which way to like ferret out his lie. Of course, he was, wasn't lying. And um, he's I like know, name all their names. You can't even remember them all at that point. I actually could remember. I have to. I have to. Have to I can actually name them. All. I can't. And I can. I can name all the cousins almost. Yeah. If you, I, see, if you see them, maybe. Yeah, I, I see. I just have to like process each family separately. And I, I can do it. You know. So but, you met him. What? So you go from not wanting to get married or have kids to extreme kids wise. Yeah, what well, was it that convinced you? We did it for like eight years, so it was to, it yeah, literally took a while. Um, you know, there was I like the big family atmosphere, and I really love his family, and uh, he's super gregarious, right? But it wasn't about having six kids. He wanted one kid actually, because he's mm. a big family, and it happens a lot where there's so many. He's one of the little ones. They go the opposite. Family. Yeah, all, and so I'm like, so we have the one. I'm like, well, we need two. You can't have just one, right? So the and then I don't know what happened. You know, I like to say, I yeah, what happened nine. between two and six? I mean. I guess I drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell your kids that. I do tell all the time. <laughs> but that's, yeah, I mean, that's significant. I mean, I have two kids and I'm like, oh my God, when they start art numbering you, I don't even, I can't even imagine. My business partner, John, he's got four kids under nine. And I'm like, listen, you did this upon, you, you did this to yourself. I don't know. So that's, I don't know, I how do you balance it all now? Like what's, what, how do you organize your day? Well, it's been really fun because of all the home Zoom schooling on top of running a business, right? So, um, you know, 18 months ago, I, I had an office for like 15, 20 years. And then 18 months ago, I pivoted to work from home for a lot of reasons, one of which is to like really hold, hoard cash and, and run a different kind of biz, business more digitally. And it was been great until everybody showed up, right? You know, the Zoom calls everywhere. And um, thankfully, they're all out of school as of today for you, for you, right? Um, it's like, you know, because I've been an entrepreneur for so long, we, the kids know not to bug me, right? They just, you know, they come bug me, we do it with their work and they, then they go away again. They're this, we're just, we, I don't know, we're just used to it, right? Yeah, I mean, we're just used to it. Yeah, and I'm also used to, I'm really used to chaos. I can work in a loud, uh, noisy zone without any issue. So, um, you know, the, the, the little baby pigs we have will wank and then the dog barks at somebody and, you know, I just can keep working. <laughs> what are some hacks you have to be more productive? Because some people you know, aren't doing a 10th of what you have to manage. Are there certain softwares you like, certain methods? What do you do? What's your tips for, for people to be more productive? I wish I had a really good tip space, but I don't. Um, I keep a lot in my head, which is bad. I have, <laughs> I fold a piece of paper in half and I write my notes down, honestly. I'm trying to get digitally on Trello and what I have Slack now, which is saving my life. I love, I love mm. Slack. Slack is like what works for me. It feeds to my phone. I can see it very specifically. I have a lot of channels and I like it because I can see exactly what the topic is and get to it. So that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my mindset is I have to get, you know, three important things done every day that move my business forward. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it, the rest of it is sort of white noise. I have to get to things, but they're not as important, which yeah. is probably true. Like, like what are the three things that that, ha that must get done? And those get done. Everything else sort of just happens at some point. Yeah. What's happening now though, I notice. um, is there's a lot more time during the day I'm not actually working where if the kids are here and then I tend to roll back at night. So there's, I'm, I'm able to, I have the luxury of, of like dissecting my day. That's good. I mean, you have three big rocks that you want to get done. So mm -hmm. you don't let the outside distract you. What, what, give me an example. What are three things maybe this week that you were really focused in on or in the past that will be an idea of that? Well, the thing I'm, I'm always focused on is production because mm -hmm. that's sort of the hat that I wear is um, orders are placed. The supply chains are still active and working and not stopped up in some manner. Um, that's super important. And the money, the finance part is um, rock two. Make sure I have enough cash to pay for things. Make sure the books are right. Sort of the third thing. And then the third thing that's um, really important is our creative launch process that we are um, that we're, we're, we're making strides to get our products launched. That's the, that's sort of like, those are the three main buckets that I focus on mostly every, every day and every week. Talk about starting true kid. Um, which product did you start with or products? What were the initial? 
initial products? Well, when I started True Kid, I had a sourcing business um, that I was actively had been actively running for 20 years where we'd help U.S. customers source and manufacture goods in Asia. So I'd help, um, you know, U.S. brands, you know, make their products dream come true. Right. Because I'm very, very good at manufacturing. And, you know, I'm I've been doing it for years. And then I recognized that there was a gap in the kids space. I, you know, all my kids were little. I think my oldest one might have been 12, maybe at the time. So I had, you know, six kids, 12 and under. And I was just noticing some of kids using my products um, and it was stinging their face. I'm like, oh God, you know, why should she use my product? It probably isn't the right product for you. So we, um, I started researching kids' brands and there really weren't any around at the time. There's a ton of baby products. And I thought, you know what? This is an opportunity to make a product that can service my family and, um, you know, have a new niche. And I thought, I could be in the baby business, but you know, babies are babies until they're 12 months, 24 months old, right? Then they're mm-hmm. done being babies. And I thought oh, if I could have a family buy my products for 10 years or more, like that's a real sustainable customer. So I thought the kids space would be more sustainable. So I hopped into the kids space with kids and you know, there weren't products out there for kids from babies. You, you would move to adult products. I thought that was really weird. So, um, you know, I just saw an opportunity. Hopped in. What were the initial products? What did you start with? I started off with sunscreen mm-hmm. and um, hair care, sunscreen, hair care, and bath. Um, and that was sort of like, you know, the, the sort of basic, you know, Repsol bath products. And uh, in the beginning, though, sunscreen was the product that sort of, you know, was our anchor because we had a product that was really natural, went on really well, um, highly rated, still is, all those things. And that was sort of our anchor product. And then we started building around it. And um, then what happened was we noticed that our customers were saying how we were serving their eczema needs, like kids with sensitive skin mm. could use our product. Because they were now natural. Yeah, they're all natural, right? Yeah. So we didn't have all the chemicals in it. And, you know, chemicals are great. They can be really irritating on anyone's skin, let alone kids with like, sensitive skin. Or if you struggle with a rash or an eczema case, like it's really hard. So I started listening and we started pivoting away from just sort of general body care to eczema focused product. Yeah. And because I noticed like it, it really sticks out. And, you know, for one, when we look at sunscreen, there's a bunch of terrible chemicals in a lot of them. So we're always thinking like, how do we not put junk? Because that stuff gets absorbed in the skin. Yeah. And I noticed, you know, on yours, which is really unique, there is a logo on all of them, right? That it from the eczema association, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. Right. It was, um, it was, a, it was a process, right? We wanted to, um, had whatever value we could add and associate with the Eczema Foundation. Because um, it's like the good seal of approval, right? You look at it and you have a, a deep sense of trust. And we had- Yeah, who's the gold standard in this, right? Yeah, they are the gold standard. So we wanted mm-hmm. to make sure that we aligned with that. And it took a lot of testing to get um, that approval on our products. So we're extremely proud of it. I think we have the largest offering of Eczema products for kids, you know? I love it. And so um, from that initial launch, what was the next product you released? And, and how did you decide that? Was you know, it a skin uh, cream or yeah, we added more eczema, fo- like o- eczema focused products, an eczema cream mm-hmm. and eczema wash. It's sort of like just going deeper into the eczema space and worrying less about sort of the other things that aren't as important. And you know, in terms of marketing too, not only are we serving kids and helping them le- lead a less itchy life, right? Like it makes me feel really good inside that I can help kids get through a day a little more calmly. Um, I lost my train of thought. What was it? What was I doing? <laughs> oh, marketing wise too. Like it's easier to market because it's it's a very defined niche, right? Yeah. We're serving a problem, people are searching for a problem to solve, and we're solving it. And that was that was a pivotal pivotal point too. Was not just we were making a quality, high quality product that served our customer base, but we could market to other folks who were searching for it. Versus um, in our space, very busy space, lots of people saying natural. There's lots of you know. Products saying natural, but they're not really natural. So it's really hard to break through the, the noise. And this is just a much easier path having a, de- a defined niche. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading, looking on the site, you know, anyone can go to True Kid, T R U K I D, kid, you know, kid.com, you know. And the funny thing is, I'm going to try and bring it up here so I can show it. But um, I was looking at the ingredients. I was like, I wouldn't try this, but I'm like, I could almost eat this stuff. Like there's like honey in it, there's like actual natural ingredients. Well, it's funny. So one of our our most popular products are our bubble pods, which is the last, the next innovation after our, you know, our eczema focused product. Yeah. We wanted kids to be able to take a bath. The bath is really fun, but kids with eczema can't take baths because everything hurts their skin. Yeah. So we create our eczema bubble pod, which is basically a Tide pod. 
um, that you throw in your bathtub creates a tuple of natural bubbles. You actually can eat that. It's really nasty tasting. But I really don't recommend that you do it. As our sunscreen. Um, there you go. There it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was like, oh, cool. Like, there's very natural ingredients there. Um, you know, what's interesting is I'm sure you get this, you know, people back then when you're doing the sourcing, what are some of the biggest mistakes people make with, with sourcing? In the U.S. or in Asia? Um, U.S. Okay. So um, because I'm so comfortable making products in China, it's like second nature to me. And the, and the, the Asian manufacturers are really, really good at making product, right? The U.S. is hard, um, and I've always struggled making product in the U.S. because the language is different. It's not Chinese to English, but the manufacturing language is different. Mm. For example, um, um, when you make things here, like in China, in China, you know, they make everything in one place. They they do all the sourcing for you. It's all it's all locked and loaded here. Um, the challenge is you have to know where to get your packaging. You have to understand the technology of the of the production that's here, and you have to like buy your labels. It's like all it's like ten times harder to make anything here. And I mm. hate to say, but that is the, that's the, my experience that I've over my years. Yeah. So the challenge is like just learning a brand new way to, to make mm. things. It's just harder. Right. What about in Asia? What are some of the big mistakes when people are sourcing from Asia? Gosh, well, you know, I've made every mistake that you could possibly make <laughs> in, in Asia. <laughs> um, one of the mistakes I think that's easy to make is um, trusting your vendor is going to make what you want right away. Like we have, I have a very defined process of how I make things in China and a different process that I do for making things here. Um, and, you know, the important part about making things in China is sourcing that you have three qualified factories versus just the one, because mm -hmm. especially right now, because it's, it's, it's absolutely chaos. I think making anything we discovered it too. And I know how to make things really well. And I'm, I'm discovering even more challenges than I had even, you know, come across in the past. So you won't do it unless you have three factories to do all, it. All qualified, all aligned. So I can make it. Mm. Um, that's my strategy. Even with that, we, you know, mistakes happen, right? You know, but, you know, make sure if you're making anything in China that you have samples. You've not sampled once, but you've sampled, you know, several times because the consistency has to be there, right? And the communication has to be really good. If they, it's, you know, if they're not emailing back or calling you back, it's a no go, right? That they just can't communicate in a way that's going to be sustainable for you long term. Do you still help people? Do you still get questions from people about sourcing? Uh, I get, I, I don't, do that. I closed that business yeah. in 2017 yeah. um, to simply focus on growing the True Kid business. Yeah. I realized it was a real distraction of my time. Um, I do it for friends and I help people. I, I, I asked, you know, for kids, people. like kids, you help with kids. Sure. Oh, yeah. Is that your <laughs> and I'm, I'm really good at making things here. Now I've learned, I mean, I've, I've honed that skill set too. You know, it's harder here. It takes longer. I don't, I don't know why that is, but it's, that's the new challenge. It just takes, you know, Something I could get done literally in 45 days in China, beginning to end, brand new, um, takes me six months here. So let's talk about HyperGo. So yeah. Freddie and Ma, let's talk about launching HyperGo. Yeah, so this is my business. Um, so I started this back in 2014 when I was 14. And it really stemmed from when I was driving all these, like, you know, two hours to a volleyball tournament or a basketball tournament. And I just didn't want to sit in a car for two hours on the way home with eight different guys, you know, just like sitting in sweat. It's just a snowy <laughs> car, and, you know. And I was just like starting to get acne. I always just I had this thing. It was like I had braces at the time. I was like, Freddie, I can't have acne and braces. You know, <laughs> I, I got to get this sweat off my face immediately. And, you know, my mom's always wanted me to have a business. You know, she's an entrepreneur. And I've kind of always wanted to, you know, follow in that step. And so I like came to her this, with this idea. I was like, Mom, like, what about a wipe, you know, that you can just wipe down and you're basically showered? And she's like, you know, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> and so she really just help me, you know, find factories. And mm -hmm. what she said about samples, like it is so true. We maybe got like 80 different samples because mm. every time, you know, it'd be a little bit different and, or like this one had too much scent, something like that. So really it took a little bit, but with her expertise, it was, um, it finally came to a product that we really enjoyed. And so we get like reviews all the time. Like, wow, this is so perfect for, um, like I bike to work, but my work doesn't have a shower, like hyper go wipe down. You're ready to go to work. And like during, during COVID right now, a lot of people, you know, are on Zoom calls between for school or for work. And a lot of people have been telling me that they do workouts in between their Zoom calls. Mm. Um, there's no time for a shower. So they just wipe right down and they're ready to get back to work. 
from I mean, that I that imagine must be popular now with COVID. Mm -hmm. What kind of properties? I'm sure you got questions of can I wipe this my table down? Can I wipe myself and my surroundings? How does it work as like an antibacterial or or that? Well, we do have like honey, which is a natural antibacterial, but it does not have contain alcohol, which is like, you know, the ingredient you need to kill 99% of viruses. So while this won't kill everything, it's definitely better than having nothing. <laughs> What's the best use case for it? So you mentioned someone's biking to work. Mm -hmm. Someone is working out right before a Zoom call. What else do people use it for? Um, camping. People love doing this because they're biodegradable. So oh, okay, really good for the environment. Um, it really is just a wipe for everything. You know, it's interesting. Um, I get car sick a lot. And uh, we were driving to LA for some reason. Of course, I got car sick, had to hop over. And I'm like, you know, can somebody give me a wipe? And of course, everybody was on their phone, so nobody heard me. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> of course, right? But I, you know, I, I, leak, I see over and I see a big pack of wipes. And it never would have dawned on me because, like, the wet wipes for babies are small. Mm -hmm. Our friends, friends are really Huge. big. And it's like, I can tell you, it makes every wipe up situation 100% better. Mm. And I have a lot of friends that have babies that use our product for a baby wipe because you can use one wipe when they when they poop all over themselves versus like 10 little baby wipes. It's so fantastic. Yeah, you the really, size. You really it, never know when you're going to need a wipe. It comes in handy in like now, every honestly. situation. And like they're 12 by 12, so we just call it a square foot of clean. Like you'll never know when you need that. Yeah, it's awesome. So talk about launching it. So you you get these 80 samples you're like okay we need the best of the best mm -hmm. you got it talk about how you decide how many to order and then launch it well so that was one of the big reasons why we didn't do you know like start manufacturing in the u.s right away is because their moqs were just way too high you know this is a i'm a 14 year old i'm not gonna i can't order a hundred thousand pieces that's just not feasible and so china was really like the ultimate source because we were able to only order ten thousand to start you know, to see if this product could actually like be launched and, you know, people would like it. And so that's kind of how we settled on it because we just, you know, could not launch <laughs> that many MOQ pieces. So you go to sell it. So you get, you decide the MOQ, what do you do to get it out there and to get yeah, ordered? So we listed like right on Amazon and that's still to this day is really our main sales channel. And that first year we really didn't run like many marketing campaigns, but it just it shot off. And that was when we really knew that we had a product that would work. Like we had... We got like almost like 300 reviews in the first year. People were just, it was flying off the shelves. So that was really great to see that. And also I was, I was, um, this was his idea completely. Right? I had nothing to do with help him execute. Right. And I, I, of course, my position was to help him make the best product and find the right source, you know, all those things. But it, there was nothing about this was my idea. And I, I sent him to Celia and said, you know, I can tell you, I wouldn't have had this idea. I wouldn't have. And I'm really glad that you did because now that we see the opportunity in, in this product category, it's been really fun. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, so Jennifer, for True Kid, um, talk about True Kid and, you know, do you go with Amazon strategy, both online strategy? What, when you launch a new product, where do you put it out to? What's the most successful? Well, that is so funny because we were just talking about before we get on, on this podcast how we are melding both of both our our successes, right? So Freddie's success is, um, you know, his online digital strategy and very simple packaging. It's really repeatable, really easy. Mine, yeah, mine like started out super e-commerce focused. And I have been in and out of like brick and mortar retail in Amazon, in and out of. And so we now have a strategy where um, we launch on our Shopify site and our Amazon. Mm -hmm. And our, our goal is to build the business here. And then we sell it to our, our um distribution partners in, in other parts of the world, right? So our international distribution is really important that, that that's our strategy, right? We launch online here um, to get, you know, sort of groundswell and acceptance, and then it goes um, offshore to our international partners. <clears throat> and talk, Yeah, talk about that, the distribution partners. What kind of partners? Are they doctor's offices more or? No, I have, a, so for my international people, we sell in, you know, several countries outside the U.S. And we have main, we have, you know, exclusive distributors in certain countries, right? So they, they buy up, we, you know, work a year in advance and they, and we participate in all their marketing. Um, because like, that's our channel. We were talking about earlier, like, si like simple is one of our core values and um, simple supply channels, right? more than one. Amazon's a really strong business partner for us, like really, really strong. But we, we I don't believe in having one channel. Um, I like several revenue streams coming in in case one has a problem. <clears throat> because Amazon, even though our sales are still strong because we were deemed essential, you know, it could easily could have gone another way, right? Mm -hmm. So we so we have our Shopify channel, we have our international, we have our Amazon, and we also sell wholesale customers in the US too. 
But then, you know, our international business is a huge part of our growing business because we're made in the USA, which um, I feel really, really, um, feel really proud of that we, our stuff is made in the US now. Um, it just opens up the world if your stuff is made here. And mm -hmm. so I want to make sure we have several channels that are all strong and all functioning uh, at the same time for us to grow and scale our business. And Freddie's business is, you know, we're mo mm -hmm. more just on Amazon. And so now he's starting to take the same approach with, you know, a greater revenue revenue streams. Yeah, yeah. greater brand awareness. Yeah, because yeah, we are, we just launched on GNC.com. Um, and then we are launching on Jetta.com pretty soon. And then we also launched on Sears. So yeah, what I like, so what she did in the beginning, like, you know, like all her brick and mortar stores, I'm trying, trying to do that now after I got a bunch of brand, brand awareness from Amazon. And so that's kind of what she talked about having a multi-channel fulfillment. So Freddie, talk about your day a little bit, obviously. Well, now it's a little different from COVID, but when you were in school, <laughs> like in actual school, how do you, when do you work on the business? Uh, well, luckily in college, you know, I only have like one or two classes a day. So it frees up my schedule a lot. Um, so I was always on a call with like either my social media team or, you know, with our VA trying to just get stuff done. But in high school, it was a, a little trickier, you know, that's classroom eight to three. So that's how I kind of, I kind of still have that habit where I really work best from like 10 to 12 PM at night, 12 AM at night. <laughs> that's, that's our peak. Yeah. That's our peak work time is 10 to midnight. I can't, I kid you not. I have to be ready. And I, I start earlier in the day. So I have, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm building my nighttime stamina so I can work at the same time he's working and we get so much done between 10 and midnight. I can't tell you. <clears throat> Talk about the team, the team behind true kid, you know, um, what kind of team did you have to put in place? Well, my team has definitely changed over the years. I mean, it's like, <clears throat> I'm definitely pivoting or have pivoted to a digital team. 18 months ago, I got rid of my office, like I said earlier. Um, and I got rid of my people because I, I wanted to take advantage of, like the best people I could hire were, didn't necessarily live in my town. Yeah. Um, and I knew that I wanted to have a digital team because I feel like I could scale the business greater and faster. So that's what we did. So we have, you know, you know, product people and customer service people and, you know, accounting people and all that stuff. Um, and it's, it's just such a better way to run the business. Now I've, I've had to change versus other people where I have to be, more online and more digitally tech, you know, I guess technology. <laughs> I, had to I had to teach her Slack a little bit. <laughs> a lot. I mean, Takes some getting used to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm still an email girl. I mean, it's just who I am. So, you know, I'm getting better at, at tech. Hard to break that habit. Dude, it really is. And you know, what's really hard for me too is paper is try to stop using paper. So that's, <laughs> a, that's one of my biggest challenges. Like, no, stop printing stuff out, right? So I have a big monitor now. I can look at things, uh, paper, you know, streamline, you know, and and set up the Slack and set up, like we've been very good at creating processes that are repeatable now, right? So that's one of our main core, you know, goals. What do you goals. use to create processes? Do you use different, you know, yeah. certain technology? Yeah, we start with Loom. We vi we video the process from mm -hmm. from your, your desktop, right? Mm -hmm. And then we send it to the RVA or somewhere else to make sure they can repeat the process. You know, then it gets digitized, so we can, you know, have our, you know, our lockbox of processes. So, you know, that's what I've been, Freddie. I've been, I've been challenging him these days because he's our chief digital officer, and he's very good. He's very fast technology, and I'm like, but dude, you got to be able to hand it to someone else because you shouldn't be processing orders. And so he's now, you know, listening <laughs> a little um, to get the process right. Because right now, I so said this is the perfect time. Because as we grow and scale, we don't want to have to go back and fix these processes or, or go back and try to do them. Get it yep. done right now. There's just more important things I have to do with my time than, you know, processing orders. hundred percent. Yeah, I was on with, you know, shout out to Cameron Harold. I was talking to the other day. He runs a COO Alliance and he was talking about how important processes are, SOPs are. Mm -hmm. And we were discussing, he uh, he likes, uses Sweet Process. I actually know the founder, Owen. So mm -hmm. shout out to them at Sweet Process. But yeah, you're exactly right. The SOP in that process makes it so it's repeatable, and so you could hand it to someone else, mm -hmm. and then you could focus on a you know a better now a better use of your time than doing something else. Someone also may be better at that thing than than we are, you know. Um, to what was a pivotal hire for you, Jennifer? Like you're telling Freddie, oh Freddie, in like two years, like make sure you need to hire this you know, this position. What's that? What was a pivotal hire for you as you were growing? Um, it's going to have to be, um, my production team for me, because we, we, are, you know, we're product focused, right? We're creating brand new product mm -hmm. and I need the team behind me. So having my head of, you know, product development is really important. So for what does that look like? What do you look for in a product development team? Um, uh, it's really hard to hire that position because I, yeah. I'm really good at it. And 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it out loud. I haven't found anyone who has a, a greater mastery of product development than I do because I've been doing it for so long. It is yeah. truly my strong it's my strong suit. It is finding someone that that can think like I think and um, ask the same questions so I don't have to be doing all the all the, the heavy lifting of like, well, did you say that? Did you think about that? Or, how many factors did you find, right? So it's- That is the toughest thing to do, I think, for for any business owner is the thing that you're best at, giving it to someone else or finding someone else. Mm-hmm. It's really tough. Yeah, it's hard. And I, you know, you know, I, I'm I'm not an awesome hirer. I mean, I'm not. I mean, I was better at hiring when I had my sourcing business. Like I was, I was like 95 percent accurate every time I'd hire someone because, for some reason, like that sourcing business was easier than creating brand new products on my own. I can't tell you why the difference is, but it it is for me. Um, so I take a little bit longer now to hire, and you know, I screw up a lot. What were some, I'm curious, because you have so much stuff coming through your you through your desk, especially when you're doing the sourcing and now with product. What yeah. were some of the really interesting ideas that you saw other people come to you with? Oh. Any weird, interesting ones? Well, I like, I, I joke, I, I've made um, martial art weapons, soft porn, graphic products. Um, and, you know, the... The, the most interesting thing I did was um, I had a I would do work for a, f- a food company and I had it to air airship dried herb mix for a dip like you would make add whipped cream to it or whatever or mm. sour cream to it I'd ship that to China pack it out the whole box the whole product comes back completely done right um, and one of my factories got raided and they destroyed all the herb packs because they thought it was drugs oh yeah, like, yeah it looks like comes like something like cannabis or something it's like something so you know <laughs> that's not it so it's like cause that's that's hard work that's like that's hard work right and i said i would never do it again i think i did it twice two more times um of course because i can't stop myself so that was that was hard and interesting and, and curious you you know started off working really long hours and so what took you on the, the first part of your entrepreneurial journey like when I first started my business? Yeah, you know? first started, yeah. You know, so I worked for um, um, an engineering company and I was eight months pregnant. And I thought I should probably, I, I should probably get a real job. And I worked a ton of hours. I should probably get a job where I worked less hours and be less stressful. Like that was my strategy, right? Mm-hmm. And so I then, so I got a job with a toy company, which opened up my whole world. Because um, my first job was to fly to China and open up production. I'd never done that ever. Um, and, you know... It was the thing that changed my life forever was was having this opportunity to hop on a plane on somebody else's behalf and learn a whole new skill set. And in the beginning of my business, um, I worked a ton of hours. I was on the phone to China every single night talking to factories and whatnot. And, you know, I've learned I've learned now to not stress the little things. They'll happen the next day. So now I don't hardly work eight hours in a day because I have teams of people that do it. So with the the kids, Freddie as the business, what's the kind of methodology in order? You talked a little bit about it. So first it's the idea phase. How do you, you know, brainstorm that? He came to his idea, but what do you tell your other kids? Like, here's what you should be thinking about before you actually release and come up with your your product. So um, I have four girls and two boys and Freddie's number three. And my last boy, little guy is a boy. And he and I played baseball catch, right? I used to coach his little league team and he's 12 now. So we would play catch and we talk ideas. Like the entire time we play catch, we talk ideas, right? And um, so my my strategy with the kids is to just discuss ideas while we're doing something, right? Um, because that's where ideas come from. Like the other day, Freddie and I were driving around. We had some ideas for about something that we wouldn't have had in the office. So, you know, I try to do things like that when we're not like a focused conversation about ideas for my kids doesn't work. It has to be some sort of free thing that we're doing that an idea comes up. Now, what's interesting about my kids is my four girls um, are not that interested in having a business. Not not at all. (laughs) You know, the older one is destined to be a CEO someday. I, I, I leave her to go. The second one, we're not sure. But my fourth girl, um, she wants to have a, a consulting business of some kind. I didn't remind you that's still a business. It still counts. Um, I say that. She and, just wants to make money. <laughs> yeah. No. And then Piper, my number five, will have a business. We'll, we're just going to figure it out. But they're super resistant to it. And I'm, I'm unsure why. It could be because I'm really forceful about it. Could be. Hmm. Um, but the boys it's are just- always when it comes from someone else. It 
they'll listen to a perfect stranger. Right. Yeah, they do. They do that. About it. That's that's my whole life. It's like I'm never an expert on anything, but you know, my neighbor can be. It's the same exact, it's the same exact stuff. But you know, people come to me a lot. How do you get your kids started business? And what I've seen in my house of six kids that they either naturally want to do it or they don't. At one point, um, I had the four girls ready to launch a business together because I look at them as the perfect team, right? Because they all have really different skill sets. So they mm. were the perfect team, right? And we were ready to roll. And um, the day we were going to do a photo shoot and all this other stuff, I had all the girls there. And I said, something's not right. Because like the older one snapped at the second one. The second one said, you might need to feel stupid. You, you, you name it, right? It just evolved really, really fast. And I get I, it with two girls. Trust me. I get that. Like, it, goes, it goes sideways so horribly fast. And I said, what's going on? I said, what, what have I done wrong? Right? Why is this not working? And then they realized they don't really want to work together. Like mm. it, it was too, it was too disappointed. But it, but what it was, Jeremy, it was my idea. It was my creation. It was all me, not theirs. And that was really the, a mis that was really the, when I, I had to stop myself because I have so many ideas. It's so easy for me. They didn't want to do it. It wasn't interesting to them. And then um, Georgia <laughs> said to me, she goes, Instead of starting a company, we should go to therapy, right? That's so classically her. <laughs> going, from, going from starting a company to therapy. <laughs> right? Like, and then we were talking later, and I said, I said, George, tell me what didn't work for you. She goes, You you just assumed we knew what to do because we've been around you, but you didn't stop and teach us how to do stuff. Mm. Like, oh my God. Yeah, that's so true. I didn't. I didn't say and didn't stop and say, Here's what profit looks like. Like, I think I talk about these things, but I wasn't, I didn't sit down and teach them like I would teach somebody something to do. And I real so that was, that was a few years ago. And I've now since backed way off because it was, it can't be about me. It has to be their desires and their dreams and their wants. Right. So um, I, I have every confidence and faith in my ability to persuade them at some point through subterfuge that they will do a, a business of some kind on their terms. And, um, It'll happen. Now, you know, what's nice about Freddie and Rowan, my little guy, like he wants a business and the pet business True Buddy is his and we're launching it pretty soon because he loves dogs and he loves the idea and he loves business. In fact, a couple of years ago, he said to Freddie, I'm going to crush you in sales. I do love it. it. I love it. And Freddie, what do you think about that? <laughs> I like his idea. Honestly, I hope he doesn't overtake me, but it might, it might happen. <laughs> So you're going to launch this. This is a pet. Talk about what, what that is. What are you launching with the pet? It's um, it's a pet cleansing product that's not already out in the marketplace. It's a way to, to cleanse your pet quickly and easily without having to you know keep reaching for the bottle. It comes with a, a little washing mitt and the whole thing. It's just mm -hmm. a streamlined, simple product that makes it really easy and it's sustainable it's like four or five ingredients in it and it's just it's so brilliant yeah it really it really revolutionizes pet washing it really does and we're just so excited about it and we're excited about rowan doing it too because he's super excited about it too he loves being the face of the brand like we're doing all this back end mm. work before we launch it and because he and i think and i think it's because he's the little one and he's watched it this time but he also is inclined right he's inclined to want to make money he's inclined to want to do these things like he would bring his computer over sit next to me he goes okay i'm ready to work like, but he's motivated. He's motivated. Yeah. Or like whenever he's outside playing basketball and he comes in and we always joke like, Rowan, you just missed a, a corporate meeting. He's like, I did. Why don't you just tell me? <laughs> like get Slack <laughs> on your phone and you can keep up with me. Like we, we joke all the time that he, <laughs> that we, <laughs> that we charge him 500 bucks for missing the board meeting. Like we're just joking though. But you know, <laughs> like get, get your technology right, dude. Like we, we, we talk like this and even though we're just really joking, but you know, he, um, He's coming along and he has all the technology on his phone now not to worry, right? So he gets to participate. But we want we want him to – so then he comes in and sits by us for a while, mm -hmm. even though he didn't miss a board, but he didn't really miss anything. We were just, you know, making – He's just trying to make sure he doesn't miss it again. Yeah. We honestly need a TV show about it. It's <laughs> Probably. The, you know, the importance of groups and peer groups, I know you're a big believer in, and uh, you were president of EO San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Um, so talk about EO and in the effect of EO on your business and what you do. So, um, EO is an entrepreneur organization. It's a global organization of CEOs and, um, it's, it's designed to have peer to peer learning. For example, you know, Jeremy, you're, you're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. We have a sort of a, a language of how we get through the day and we talk about things. Um, but what I love about EO is that it's a global network of peers that are struggling in the same way. I'm struggling. For example, if um, 
I have trouble with HR or I have trouble with production or I have trouble with something else um, or I need someone to help me scale my business. Someone in our group has had experience for sure. And I can send emails to folks in other chapters in other countries and other people, you know, parts of the world, you know, and it's just a way to connect in a way that I can't connect with, say, my best friend um, who is not an entrepreneur and she loves me and I love her, but she can't. I, she, she can't understand the same struggles that I'm struggling with where EO I'm surrounded by people who are living the same life I'm living, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What's it's some great advice you've gotten through from someone who, because of you were an EO, you know, there's just, there's just so much, um, you know, Cameron, I know Cameron Harold, he is, you know, part of our, our group and, you know, watching him work with Brian, a, a hunter got junk has been really inspirational on how to, how to scale a business. Right. But, um, you know, recently Mike McCallow is, is uh, you know, also an entrepreneur and it, it was about, um, you know, focus, uh, you know, focus on one thing. And, you know, his other thing too re recently was his book Profit First was, you know, entrepreneurs can be really poor because we're always putting money back into the business and not, and not, yeah, fix this next. Yeah. <laughs> I love his books. You know, I, I talked to him the other day, like you, like, you know him, you know, profit first, yeah. fix this next. Every single book he's written, the pumpkin plan is fantastic. Yeah. He's so smart. It's so good. I'm really lucky to have him as my friend. I've been handing out this book like, like crazy, but the profit first series um, book that he wrote really spoke to me because we do, so ton of entrepreneurs don't take care of themselves financially. We just keep tapping the pool of resources we have and keep putting it back into the business. And he's like, no, you got to pay yourself and get the money out of the company. So you have, so you have to do that. And so that, you know, that was probably the most recent bit of really good advice I had gotten. Um, you know, I'm like, he's my friend because we don't pay ourselves well enough all the time, you know, and like, you know, in the, your, 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 um, talk with James, like hoarding cash, my God is now the best time to hoard cash. You got to be hoarding cash. With and James, for, James Tarkin? Yeah, James. Yeah. Okay. You know, this is really important. You gotta, you gotta have some cash reserves, especially right now. This is, this is scary territory. And if you don't have a, if you don't have <laughs> some cash at, at hand, um, and Mike's book profit first helps that happen. Yeah. Yeah. So James Thompson, yeah. Buy box experts. I don't, I didn't remember that he said that, but now that you say it, yeah, he said, make sure you're, you're keeping cash on hand. It's, 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 it's just really critical. And, and, you know, and how we are launching new brands, Freddie and I, there has to be a certain, like, we must be profitable right away. I don't have tolerance for a long, lengthy, like, I hope this works kind of a thing, right? It has to be profitable, right? So there's a process that we go through to ensure that we're launching something that, first of all, the profit margin is what we, we've established and it can be, because then you can grow your business because you, you, you've got, you know, this big runway of profit that you can, you know, buy marketing and, and you know, and, and, you know, buy a new product and, you know, grow your business in other ways. If it's not profitable, like, you have to just stop. And so we, you know, that's part of our process. It's a risk. I mean, it's a risk. You buy 10,000 units. I mean, it's a, it's a comparison, right? Okay. A hundred thousand. Whoa. Okay. Let's hold back a little bit, but 10,000 for a lot of people is a lot. So how do you ensure when you put that order in for 10,000 that you're going to, cause you're bootstrapping it, right? It's not like there's like a VC out, you know, uh, funding this thing. How do you ensure, okay, like, I mean, anyone's going to be nervous regardless, but how do you ensure you're ordering these 10,000 that you, before you get them, what are you doing to make sure, okay, I, I don't want these stocking piling in my garage? Well, like, luckily I had my angel investor right here. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's true. you know, like before the product arrived, you know, it takes a little bit for it to come to China. Yeah, but your angel investor, Freddie, is, is <laughs> I wouldn't want to, I mean, I would take her seriously, you know. So yeah. you knew, she's like, you better get these, Mm -hmm. Get these flying off the shelves. I don't care, right? So, um, well, so like, luckily we had time before the product was coming. It's like we got all our product photography done, and we had our Amazon listing. It's like mm -hmm. you know, optimized as best they could, and we really were just. I always, I had all my friends go and buy it on Amazon, so we could start getting reviews, and that's really a big part of it. Is no one's going to buy a product with no reviews, and so I feel like that was really the start of it. I had all my friends try out my product. I was like, please, like, I'll send you guys a code. Just go on Amazon and buy it, and it really that's how we kind of just started building up. Like once then more people, you know, word spreads. It really was a lot of word of mouth or word of like, I don't know, uh, Amazon search, but it really just started spreading from there. And when we did hope, like the goal was that we'd be able to unload 10,000 pieces yeah. in a <laughs> we were, year, right? That, I mean, we that was hoping. a lot, dude. That was a, it was a risk, right? It was a category yeah. I wasn't familiar with. And like, I, I felt based on our research that we could, if it failed, 
we could sell it, right? We yeah. could sell it and get rid of it. I felt confident that no matter what, we wouldn't, you know, it, maybe we broke even, but we wouldn't get hurt. And at the time we launched it, like there was very little competition, like the, you know, workout wipe space. There's like really nothing. So we were hoping that since we picked such a, a niche that, you know, a lot of people need the wipe, but just there was no one to offer them that product. We we're really hoping that this would, you know, set off. Jennifer, you know, what is uh, any of you have any recommendations on other groups they should look at or books they should look at for business uh, leaders or entrepreneurs? I know EO is one. Are there any other books or groups that you recommend people check out? Well, you know, I'm always looking for new groups because, you know, I, you know, for sure belong to a group, right? Um, Freddie and I both belong to 10X, which is an online Slack channel for entrepreneurs, which you know has lots of different categories and lots of different expertise. I quite, I kind of like that. Who runs uh, that? Is that just, is that like uh, more because you knew someone in the group, or can anyone who's an entrepreneur join that? Um, I think it might be gated also. Okay. Yeah, I think I've heard of it. I think yeah. it, is, it is gated. I believe it is gated. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, that's probably all. I, you know, there's you know. What was it? Gathering of Titans, whatever. Oh yeah, but that's part of that's part of EO. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Any other books that you're like tell your kids to listen to or read that would be helpful from a business standpoint or entrepreneur standpoint? <laughs> well, you know what? I'm a big fan of the Four Hour Work Week mm -hmm. uh, because I I realize that I can I'm really productive. Like I said, between ten and midnight. Um, so if I can get all my work done then, which is not exactly true, I'm going to get it done. So my kids all haven't read it. Like they 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 resist things. Um, you know. I, I can't really write other than Mike's books. I read all Mike's books because <clears throat> they're easy to read and they're interesting and they're informative. Mike, what have you found? Like if you're talking to another person who's your age or maybe in high school and you're like, listen, you should check out this resource or I found this helpful from, from your standpoint. Um, well, I think like, you know, my direction's like less used to reading like really long things. So I'm just always Google searching. Like I, that's how I'm always finding new stuff. Um, it's just like, that's how I find new marketing stuff, new, just new ways to like optimize our listings. I'm always just searching for new things. So I wouldn't, I can't think of like one specific. I don't know if there was like a YouTube channel. You're like, oh, I always check this person's show out. I was like, you can't stop at the first Google search. Like I'm going to, you know, like page two, three, you know, you, most people don't usually do that because everything you want is on the first page, but you can really find some like useful stuff. You just keep going. Cause like maybe they're just not as like, yeah. you know, ready for i want to highlight that for a second that's a really smart piece of advice freddie you know like when i'm doing research on a guest and i talk about them like jeremy how do you know that and i'm like i went to the second page of google like it's <laughs> literally how many people right. do it? it's yeah. i just dug much you know a little bit deeper than everyone else maybe the second third page and like how did you find that i mean when you go past the first page of google wh whatever you're researching it could be a business it could be a you know just you want to um, research a company, you go to the second page of Google, like most people haven't gotten past the first search result, right? So yeah. that's a really, I just want to hone in that a really smart, it seems simple, but it's, it's, it's simple is not necessarily easy. And it's not what people do. Right. So Jeremy, I want to, I want to point out something that Freddie just said too, right? So like, he resists, he resists learning the way I learn. And I have to ex ex respect that. Like I'll read or I'll listen and I'll watch things and I have to mm -hmm. drag him to a podcast to listen. And, but he, mm -hmm. because they don't have the, the patience, right? It has to be really short snippets. So what you mean, like TikTok. Is, <laughs> no joke. We should just do, we should do this whole podcast of TikTok, right? It'd be over in 30 seconds or less. Um, <laughs> seriously, is that's where he finds all of his knowledge and he sends it to me and then I send him articles which he scans um and then like let's let's watch this thing it's like you know i don't want to watch it right which is very how much why this works really well because i'm going to be reading things he's looking at things that look that last 15 seconds and somehow that work that works we both bring like really different perspectives on like issues you know? yeah i don't i don't ever see freddie reading a business book not ever <laughs> actually if there was a cliff notes for, maybe he'd take a look at it but that generation and it, it could be just him um it's just it's it's not interesting to them. They will mm -hmm. find your information in other ways. Freddie, what software or technology are you trying to force your mom to use that you think is essential that she has not listened to yet? On <laughs> uh, well, I really like Asana. It's like a, you know. Uh -huh. Oh, big, big user of Asana. Totally. Yeah. So like I was going through, you know, like there's like Monday and all of a sudden I was like, I don't really want to pay for this. <laughs> and Asana is like free for, you know, smaller teams. 
Um, so like we originally were using Trello, you know, my mom had a little bit of trouble using that. So I was like, let's just try to find it. And we, I haven't fully gotten her there yet, but it's how I keep like, so when we were like, you know, designing new products, like we always do a lot of like give and take. She's like, I want this logo. I'm like, fine, I'll give it to you. Cause I'm going to fight you on something else later down the line. I'm always tracking that in the sauna. So every, t if she ever you says, are? if she ever says like, uh, no, 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 <laughs> I gave you this logo or like this design aspect or, you know, yeah. this choice. I'm like, no, I have this written down. <laughs> but like also I just use it to like, you know, track my like social media team. That's how I'm always, you know, sending them. I'm writing down like new ideas for like social media posts, stuff like that. It's just like a great tool to track totally. all of my work. Yeah. Plus one on Asana. What else? Anything else that you, she should be using? Um, totally. I'll, I'll second that 100%, Jennifer. I'll, I'll totally back that up and happy to to pull up our Asana board. We use it religiously, religiously. Yeah. So, yeah. I know I need to do it. It's just part of one of the things I'm... This really isn't like an intervention or anything. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I mean, but we'll make it into one. You, you should intervene for sure because I do resist. I persist. Like straight yeah. up, what I else, do. Freddie? What other technology? Or um, so we talked about Slack, Asana. What are other critical software well, that you're seeing? For social media, uh, like Sprout Social. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah, they're out of Chicago, by the way. Yeah, Sprout oh, really? Social. I didn't know that. Yeah. I haven't really, I haven't transferred, like, I we always use, like, my. Why Sprout Social as opposed to one of the other ones? There's a lot of them out there. There's Buffer. I've had the founders of Buffer on, Meet Edgar on. Um, well, what my social media team told me was that a lot of those Instagram, like, repostable things or, like, schedulers are being taken down or something like that because they're not following the strict Instagram guidelines because hmm. Instagram is choosing to. So like, specifically for Instagram. So like, like yeah. the meet Edgar, the buffers are fine for Facebook mm -hmm. and LinkedIn or whatever, but, but you find Sprout Social is better for Instagram. Yeah. Cause um, I was told that it's the one that like follows Instagram's guidelines so closely. So I know that it'll be here because a lot of them have been taken down apparently hmm. because Amazon wants you to be like posting by yourself and not having a machine do it, but that's just not feasible for businesses. And it was Sprout, yeah. we get insights into like, you know, the best hashtags we get, it's just, I know they kind of showed me that this is the tool they like, you know, and I've just come really, I've grown accustomed to using it. And so that's just, I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's Hootsuite, yeah. there's Meet Edgar, there's Buff, there's so many out there. Yeah, we used to use Hootsuite and that was prior to. Post for me. And so that's, I kind of switched, that's when we switched over to Sprout and we've just been using that ever since. Okay, and you like it. <laughs> yeah, I like okay. it a lot. Anything else? Yeah. Well, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, uh, we have mentioned Upwork. You know, you're from Upwork, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, we I love Upwork. <laughs> we love Upwork because and this is part of our digital team, right? We 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 may need a one off something, rather we might need some renderings, mm -hmm. and 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 Freddie's gotten really good at creating posts to that that garnered the, like the best talent. Now, um, I kind of suck at it, but he's much better. And that's you know, we love we love we're all we we always have a post on Upwork for something or another. Um, it just mm -hmm. it strengthens our our abilities to get work done faster, and yep. that's. Super and I love that. And, you know, and, you know, hats off to Freddie for forcing me into the new te technological <laughs> age. Yeah. I want to be fr a front runner in technology because I want to spend less time running my business and have it sort of run on the background while I do what I'm good at, which is creating stuff. I don't want to yep. be the stuff. And if technology can make that better for me, you know, I'm jumping in with both feet, although with re resistance. So um, I have two last questions. First of all, thank you. This has been tremendously valuable. Um, before I ask those questions, I'm going to point people to your sites, which is hypergo.com uh, for Freddie's like, full body wipes. Like <laughs> I'm just going to get one. Boom. Like you're good. And then go to truekid.com, T-R-U-Kid.com. Um, I always ask this because it's Inspired Insider. Um, what's been a low moment, a challenge moment that you had to push through in the business? And then what has been a proud moment? And so I'll have you each, Freddie, why don't you go first? What's been a challenge moment for you that you really, I don't know, like at a point like, ah, should I even do this anymore? Like wh where was a challenge moment and then a proud moment? Um, well, like that, I would say, so my mom has always been like, you know, pushing me to be, you know, a face of Nick, my brand. And so she'd always like, you know, I, well, I spoke at this uh, Harvard business event. Um, it was like a, for like a business group in the city. Um, and I was like, I had like, you know, I was super anxious. It was like when I was like 
15 or 16. I did not want to do it. And so like, I was fighting for, for like with her up to weeks before because I just did not want to get in a state on a stage in front of all those people. Most people don't. Yeah, yeah I was, exactly. I was like, I was just afraid of like, you know, being in front of all those people, but she like forced me to get through it, which kind of helped know that self-promotion is like a really important part of your brand. You know, entrepreneurs have their own brand when they're like building their companies. And I was just always scared to be like, put myself out there. But once I did that, it was, that was like a low because I was just, I was not happy those weeks prior. I was like, I did not want to do it, but I'm glad I did because it kind of got me out of my comfort zone to be able to, you know, my, it's a cool story. You know, I was like a 14 year old entrepreneur. Like that's a story that should be shared. And I was too scared to do it, but I'm glad that <laughs> I got put out of my comfort zone to do that. So that would definitely be a low moment. Um, and then uh, like one of the best ones, like I always used to like go on Amazon and like see where everyone was ordering from. And once we hit the 50th state mark that we had sold to someone in every single state, hmm. I was like so ecstatic. I don't, I don't go look at now cause now we're, you know, we're way past that, but that was definitely a high moment. Cause I was like, that's so cool. Every single, every single state has someone ordering our product. Like that's how we know, like we're really getting out there. That's awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. I, you, I, what were you say? I had no idea that he was tracking that metric. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What's been? What was a big challenge? A moment, low point in the journey, and then on the flip side. Well, I tell you, we had a, an Amazon struggle because we, um, you know, when I had made, we had uh, been selling to Amazon Vendor Central, um, which seemed like a really, really good idea, and, is, and roll back over to FBA. And um, that was a year of pain because um, getting out of that is really hard because they buy so much, which is good on one hand. On the other hand, it took me a year to get all my listings back. So that was really hard, hard work. And um, thankfully, we've had it back for a while. So, you know, now we're seeing terrific success. And, you know, a really proud moment, and I actually might even cry right now, is um, Freddie's been home from school because of COVID. So he has to be here. His office is behind me, right? And so we've been working together. And then he decided that, um, we need to build this media company together. So we're building a new company, incorporating all of our brands. And he chose me as his partner. Hmm. And I'm going to cry probably. And we we defined our roles. He's a teach digital officer. I'm the CEO, which he tries to always take from me every single day. But that moment of let's work together, hmm. um, I I can't tell you how how proud it makes me that he wants to work with me of all people. That is amazing. What is the media company? Um, so like what we're launching it's, is it's more of a catch. Yeah, off. it's more of like a like a big umbrella of all of our new brands that we're launching, and like we like to call it approachable wellness. And so we're creating a, affordable and simple products that you know are accessible to everyone instead of you know because the wellness space is usually your there's like a hundred dollar serums, and that's just not you know that's not a feasible feasible for like everyone. And so we want to you know make products that you know are really innovative yet they're open to everyone. Yeah, and that's kind of our next step. Well, thank you for letting me partake in this mother son session. I totally appreciate both of you. Everyone should check out hypergo.com, truekid.com, check them out. And thank you both for sharing the story. You know, Jeremy, it was so fun to talk to you. Thank you for letting us on and, you know, waste your time like this for an hour. <laughs> Not at all. Now the, the catch is to have make sure Fred, all Freddie's friends watch more than three minutes of this. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.